Chapter 2.8. Who is the Programmer? In the discussions between evolutionists and creationists, the strong argument of the latter is the following. Even if there is a set of components capable of changing their state, such as in a computer, this does not mean that the computer can perform necessary work. Each computer needs a program, without which it is a useless set of components. Hence, they reason, behind all this, there is an intelligent designer. Well, that is a strong objection, to which the evolutionists have no answer, except for references to the obscure action of natural selection. And yet, the answer to this question lies on the surface. Those of us who grew up before the digital computer technology era know the type of computers called the analog ones. How do they differ from the familiar digital computers? About the same as the music recorded on a digital CD and delivered to the dynamics by most modern amplifiers differs from the warm lamp sound of vinyl records. The analog computer computer can be a logarithmic ruler, and an astrolabe can be mechanical, pneumatic, electric, or hydraulic. I will tell you a story from a past Soviet-era life. In the Chelyabinsk, Ural region, at an important plant that produced ball bearings, the ball calibrator broke down. Its mission was to find out if the balls were as perfectly round as they were required. Bearing with imperfect balls would not roll far. Calibrator was a sophisticated machine. Computerized to the limit, it occupied a separate premise. A team of engineers and technicians took care of its proper functioning. It was bought in Switzerland and cost a lot of money. The calibrator's malfunction threatened the whole plant operation. The management appealed to the Swiss manufacturer, but they, sensing the blood, put forward unacceptable conditions for repair. Time was running out. The CEO was pressing on the chief engineer. The latter summoned local Edisons and asked for help. And what do you think? The Ural's investors have found a solution. Not only they proposed, but also implemented it. They scratched their heads, took the usual metal ruler, calculated its length and width. They estimated the angle of inclination and speed of the ball, tilted the ruler at a small angle, and voila, a new calibrator was born. The balls rolled down on the ruler. If the ball was perfectly round, it reached the end of the ruler. If the deviations from the roundness went beyond the permissible limits, the ball fell aside into a box with failed parts. Honestly, I do not vouch for the authenticity of this story, but it illustrates the principle of the simple and natural analog computer operation. And this is not the only example. In the Russian north, when people founded a new habitat, it was necessary to find a suitable place for the church. It was a special task that required not only a deliberation, but also an inspiration. Russian peasants found their own way to find a solution. They harnessed the horse in the cart, or sleigh, and covered its eyes. In the cart, they placed an icon and gave the blinded horse a gentle whip to inspire her for the action. Where the cart stopped, a temple spot was set up. The place selected by the horse was always suitable for the people and approved by them. And how the horse knew where to go and where to stop? It is very simple. A horse stopped on the summit of the nearest hill. When the horse reached the top, and when she felt a slope under her feet, she was scared and remained there. The church also had to stand on a high place so that the view was beautiful and closer to the sky. How to describe the actions of a blind and illiterate horse from a mathematical point of view in scientific terms? It sounds like this. It performs an algorithm for searching for a local maximum. When solving such a problem, the professor of mathematics will not lose his head either. He will write analytical functions corresponding to the terrain, develop a sophisticated algorithm for finding the extremum, set the criterion for finding the solution in acceptable terms, introduce the algorithm into the computer together with the coordinates of the starting point, and after a month or two of hard work, find a local maximum. There is a special discipline dealing with the search for extrema on multidimensional surfaces. They call it a non-linear programming. A lot of mathematicians work in this field and develop increasingly sophisticated methods for this extrema finding. The Russian horse finds it without all this science. True, the final points the horse found did not guarantee that the church was built at the highest place on the earth. Otherwise, all churches would be built on Everest. What the horse found is called a local extremum in mathematical slang. Most of the time, local extremum is quite acceptable. The settlers will not wander all over the world in order to put their church above all others. There is a hill, a church on it. The peasant exits it after Sunday service, looks around happily, and his soul soars. The task is fulfilled. Science has a lot of tools for local and global extremum finding. The peasant will make everything more elegant and precise. Let us say he needs to choose 
choose the lowest place here on a certain hilly terrain. It is a very easy task for our sensible peasant. He will order his children to take a break in the soccer game and send them to do their homework. The peasant then puts a soccer ball somewhere and gives it a slight push. The ball rolls around and ends predictably at the lowest point, the global or local minimum. And there is no need for any programs, neither for an algorithm. If the surface is smooth, the ball itself will roll to the point where it should be. Here, however, is a catch. The ball is fine. It will go effortlessly. But what if the horse gets tired? And what if you want to transfer the intermediate results of the search to the inhabitants of another village or to the next generation? And if the method needs to be constantly improved? And if the surface is not two-dimensional but multi-dimensional? Let us not forget that creating a new living organism is a much more complicated task. It is necessary to take into account many parameters. Each parameter adds one more coordinate access to the surface picture on which you have to find the optimum. This task needs a memory, and not just memory, but super duper memory. It is impossible to imagine an n-dimensional surface, and it is impossible to imagine the trajectories of motion along it in search of the best solution. Therefore, at every point mentally reached, the designer needs to evaluate the result and memorize all the coordinates. Well, our global biological computer has has enough memory capacity. Darwinism suggests that evolution has proceeded through the physical realization of biological changes and the selection of the fittest of them. My hypothesis suggests that the search for the best solution was first carried out by looking through the options, and only when an acceptable model of a new living organism was designed and virtually constructed, a new species was physically born. The gene composition was selected, the whole complex structure and technologies of the interaction of its its constituent parts were memorized. Chromosomes, membranes, mitochondria, etc. This already constituted the finished product of the future plant or the animal. After that, the new organisms are created simultaneously, according to the final blueprints. How was it created? Of course, not from a dust from the ground. Nature already had ready-made bricks, from which a new model could be built by certain combinations and modifications. The new organism was molded by changing and combining the parameters of already existing individuals. Therefore, evolution also took place abruptly, in full accordance with the speculative theory of intermittent equilibrium and data of paleontology. Deceptive and simultaneously tempting was, for the Darwinists, the idea to declare that all organisms originating from one ancestor. In this, they have a point. However, the creation of new species did not happen by chance, but by the conscious work of global mind. Are there any analog computers in the wild? Actually, yes, and in big numbers. The Bumblebee, insects, which are not at all sophisticated in the advanced C++ or COBOL programming languages, quite successfully solve the already mentioned program of the traveling salesman. They do not need science. Stupid insects have their own BB++, Bumblebee Basic, and it works perfectly. A group of winged workers unerringly finds the shortest paths between fragrant flowers and nectars using their biological computer. Many admired, perhaps, the geometric accuracy of the flight of a pack of cranes. Scientists have found the most economical angle under which birds should be ranked so that air resistance for each bird is minimal. They calculated this angle as close to 110th to the zero, and the crane wedge is lined up in close correspondence to this figure. We do not suppose that the leader of the pack has outstanding mathematical abilities. No, but each bird instinctively chooses the position in the air in which it spends a minimal effort. The result is the same as for computing on a supercomputer. Doctor of Biology Alexei Sharov from the Baltimore Institute of Aging in his article, Time in Living Systems, writes, Even single-cell organisms can make their unwelt in their time. Thus, the brain is not necessary for making models. Nucleus is the brain of the eukaryotic cell. It carries long-term memory, which is communicated across generations and is represented by the genome. In addition, it carries short-term memory represented by epigenetic marks, which are various modifications of DNA-binding proteins called histones. German biologist Jacob von Euchskull believes that every living organism makes and communicates a model of its environment, and all meaning 
mountains are produced in this way? Why do archaeologists not find innumerable transitional forms of plant and animal life? After all, if evolutionary development had progressed gradually, according to Darwin, then along with the existing creatures, there would have been an almost unlimited number of transitions between them. Each plant or animal would differ from the early one by a very small degree, literally by one mutation. But they are practically non-existent. Only stable populations are found, and in considerable quantities. Evolutionists tried to explain this by the presumption that not all samples made it through hundreds of millions of years. They decomposed, were eaten, have not yet been found, and so forth. But what about the period of no more than 200,000 years? Scientists found the bones, habitants, tools, rock carvings of early hominids. Still, nowhere the transitional forms were located. The biggest number of predecessors' fossils the scientists reported to the date is 450. Maybe it is time to confess honestly that they were not found because they did not exist? The new species were created at once, without any intermediate prototypes. As soon as the entire structure of the new species was recorded in the global mind memory, as soon as it became clear that new kind not only turns out to be viable, but also fits well into the pyramid of the already existing living nature, then global mind proceeded to its serial production. I am not sure whether it is true or a legend, but brilliant Serb Nikola Tesla had the same ability. He did not need a drawing board or an arithmometer to create a new generator or turbine. His powerful intellect designed all the details in his mind, assembled them, tested the assembly speculatively, rotated them in his head, subjected them to overloads, eliminated flaws. After that, he gave the task to the engineers to build new machines in this and that way. And historically, everything seemed to work according to his ideas. The creation of a new species by the global mind occurred, most likely, at once, but not by building one plant or one pair of new animals. Such a single sample production would not have a chance of survival. Life, as we know, is a mass phenomenon, collective schooling. It seems that the birth of a new one takes place based on the old one. It was necessary to use all parts and components. It looked like a bee swarm, that is, a group was created at once, a flock, a shoal, a colony, a herd, a community, a tribe, etc. No living being can exist by itself. This equally applies to both lower and higher living organisms. Let me illustrate this position with a quote from Howard Bloom's book, The Lucifer Principle. Another creature enlisted in a superorganism is the citizen of a society called the sponge. To you and me, a sponge is quite clearly a single clump of squeezable stuff. But that singularity is an illusion. Take a living sponge, run it through a sieve into a bucket, and the sponge breaks up into a muddy liquid that clouds the water into which it falls. That cloud is a mob of self-sufficient cells, wrenched from their comfortably settled life between familiar neighbors, and set adrift in a chaotic world. Each of those cells has theoretically got everything it takes to handle life on its own. But something inside the newly liberated sponge cell tells it you either live in a group or you cannot live at all. The micro-beasts search frantically for their old companions, then labor to reconstruct the social system that bound them together. Within a few hours, the water of your bucket grows clear, and sitting at the bottom is a complete, reconstituted sponge. Like the sponge cells in the slime mold amoeba, you and I are parts of a vast population whose pooled efforts move some larger creature on its path through life. Like the sponge cells, we cannot live in total separation from the human clump. We are components of a superorganism. In the 1940s, the psychologist Rene Spitz studied human babies isolated from their mothers. These were the infants of women too poor to care for their children, infants who had been placed permanently in a foundling home. There, the children were kept in what Spitz called solitary confinement, placed in cribs with sheets hung from the sides so that the only thing the babies could see was the ceiling. Nurses seldom looked in on them more than a few times a day, and even when feeding time came, the babies were left alone with just the companionship of a bottle. Hygiene in the homes was impeccable, but without being held, loved, and woven into the fabric of a social web, the resistance of these babies was lowered. 34 out of 91 died. In other foundling homes, the death rate was even higher. In some, it climbed to a devastating 90%. A host of other studies have shown the same thing. Babies can be given food, shelter, warmth, 
health and hygiene. But if they are not held and stroked, they have an abnormal tendency to die. Let us again take the analogy with the complex apparatuses created by man. We use radio and tape recorders. But it is unlikely that we have seen transitional forms from one to another. It would not be nice to find something on the store shelf, a uh, half radio, half tape recorder that would not take your favorite radio station properly and chew up tape rather than playing the recorded music. Such a device would not have a chance for survival. It would not have had a chance of survival either should such a device were made in a single copy. After all, the successful production requires solid preparation, drawings, technologies, molds, rigging, stock of the necessary radio components, personnel training, quality control, only in the presence of all these conditions, with the preparation of all the links in production and marketing, one can think of a new device. Logic and experience tell us that when designing a new device, the designer strives to use most of the stock of old parts, technical solutions, nodes, and their interaction. Therefore, in both receiver and tape recorder, you can find similar amplifiers, switches, etc. Similarly, in a mouse and human genomes, you can find a lot of identical and similar genes. The the development of technology does not occur in a big leap. It goes slowly, but intermittently, as science and technology develop. Progress is not made by tiny steps. The new invention is sometimes a shallow, and less often a significant breakthrough occurs in our thinking. For every small revolution, we must mature and accumulate a critical mass of intelligence. In a living world, where global mind reigns, development proceeds in the same way. In order for a new species of the living world to appear, two conditions are necessary, as in the world of things. One, there must be a demand for innovation. Two, a critical mass of global intelligence must be achieved to implement a new project. These conditions arise and develop mature in unison. As the intellectual mass grows, new needs arise. Global mind did not create Homo sapiens a million years ago. Firstly, that time there was no urgent need for us. The living world existed and multiplied quite well. The amount of accumulated global mind memory was perfectly preserved in living beings then. Secondly, the critical intelligent mass was not achieved. The creation of a human race was a revolutionary breakthrough in global mind design history. It created many traits that the former animals did not have. It seems that the next stage in the global mind work will be something even more innovative. It has already reached a qualitatively new level of critical intelligence mass. First, at its disposal, there is the entire thinking power of 7 billion people. Secondly, global mind has something it never enjoyed before. It obtains the tools, instruments for measurements, calculations, technological operations. All of this were invented by the Homo sapiens created by global mind under its sensitive and directing guidance. Until now, global mind managed with improvised means and coped quite well. But having a variety of tools at hand is useful. Thus, our hypothesis naturally unites all the dominant concepts, the blind watchmaker of the gradualists and the sudden transformation of the saltationists and the unguardable complexity of the creationists, and the concepts of the self-evolution of Roklenko, Ben Jacob, and James Shapiro. For a spontaneous search for an extremum, two things were needed. A, the need for better solution, and B, the initial impulse. So far, we have not answered two very significant questions. One, why the nature would go anywhere at all if the most primitive organisms are the fittest? And if it has a stimulus to move, then why the evolution goes in the direction of higher intelligence as opposite to omnivorous or temperature-resistant creatures? Two, if there is such a need, what is the impetus for creating a new model? Who generates this initial impulse? The answers are in the following sections.